All right, welcome everybody to the 1700 Contemporary Service. I am Cody, and I'm here to welcome you on this great day. Um, praise God, he is an awesome God, and, and, and I'm just so excited that we are in a place where we can come and gather and be together. Even, even there, no, though there is a pandemic going on, but we are still here and able to exercise our freedom of religion to worship our God. And with that, we'll get into our announcements. So right now we have the men's Bible study that's at 1830 on Tuesdays, and that is currently at 4207 Bravo in the backyard so that we can adequately socially distance, and there is food provided at that Bible study. We also have the women's Bible study, which is on Tuesdays as well, uh, at the same time as the men's Bible study, and that's at the chapel. And we have the Officer Fellowship, that's at 1930 on Thursdays at various locations. Please find me or uh, Jen, and we'll get you plugged in for that if you're interested to go into that. And then we have the Theology and Breakfast, which has been put on hold temporarily. Um, be looking out for an update on that. We're still going to, when we come back to gather for that, we're still going to be going over the theological themes throughout the Gospel of John. And if you're interested and want more information on that, please come see me and I'll get, to get that information to you. But with that, that brings us to our, our time of prayer before we get into worship. And prayer is vital to our walk and our relationship with God. Um, and it's very important that we confess our sins, for we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we must repent of those sins because it's, it's essential to our relationship because we can't keep moving forward if we're allowing these sins to drag us down. And we can't come to God with a, without an empty slate. So it says in Acts 3, 19 through 20, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. So let's take, take this time to bow our heads and pray and ask for forgiveness of our sins. Dear Father, we come to you today to thank you for everything you've done for us, God. We ask you to forgive us where we have failed you, where we have sinned against you, God. And we know the only forgiveness for our sins comes through your atonement, through the death of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, we just come, you know, asking for that forgiveness that our slates can be wiped clean. God, we just thank you again for, you know, dying on the cross for our sins and allowing us to come and worship you today. But let us be reminded that it's not about us or that anything we have done, it is all because of you. And this is all for you, Father. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. And that brings us to our call to worship. Coming out of Exodus 15, 1 through 2. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Please rise as we start to worship and, and sing in our hearts.
And we're going to pick up our next reading here in verse 105 through 112. Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. Here is the word of the Lord. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, I pray, the freewill offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your judgments. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. Amen. You can see how serious the psalmist is here about his relationship with the Lord. May God be praised for that. As we continue, we'll sing another song and then we'll have our offering. Amen. You can stand with us if you want. as we've done in the past during these uh, COVID conditions is we have, of course, the QR code, which is on the card there on the back table that can, you can scan if you into electronic. And also we have the offering plate that you can drop uh, your money in on the way out. And so that'll be the way we give until things change. All right, let's ask the Lord's blessing on the offering. Father, we just take this time to thank you for the many gifts you've given us, the gift of health, the gift of work, the gift of being able to earn. And so, Father, we want to take now a portion of that which you have given us and give back to you. Lord, giving to strengthen the work of the ministry here. Father, to strengthen the work of those other ministries that we support. Lord, because we have 
airmen and families that are in need of spiritual resilience. Father, we have programs and events that we want to put on for all those that are in our care here on this base, and we just ask that you'd strengthen us and give us generous hearts as we give to make these things happen. And we know, Lord, that you're going to bless us for it, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So if you'll take your Bibles or your phones and turn to Acts chapter 16. This is Communion Sunday, and I have been making it my purpose to preach on a salvation word. We will run out of them eventually, but we'll keep going as long as there are words like that. So uh, I have preached on regeneration, which means that a person has to be made alive, born anew or born again by the Holy Spirit, and that's a work of God. We who are dead in our trespasses and sins, the Lord gives life. And that's and that relationship that is between us and God is one of enmity, and that's why the scripture uses the word reconciliation. And I preached on reconciliation where God has to reach down and through his work cause us to be reconciled to him. During Reformation time last month or back in October, late October, we looked at the word justification, which was that great event of the Reformation era in which Martin Luther realized as he studied the scriptures that we are declared right by faith and not by works. And today, the word ransom, ransom. But I want to start with this idea that uh, came to my mind as I was preparing, and it was about a lady named Alice Marie Johnson. Alice Marie Johnson, back in August of this year, was given a presidential pardon you see, she was involved way back in 1996 in cocaine trafficking and money laundering. She was caught by federal authorities, sentenced, and put in a federal prison for life with no parole. That was in 1997. She served over 22 years in prison until not too long ago this year, the president pardoned her, and she was released. Then you have someone like the Apostle Paul that we see here as he goes about his ministry in and through all kinds of places that are right here in our own backyard in Turkey. And we find in chapter 16, verse 25, if you'll look with me, in the, chapter, in the verses just above that, 22, 3, and 4, we find that he is beaten with many stripes, thrown into prison with the command to keep him securely. And he was even put into, as it says in verse 24, the inner prison. So this is probably like deep in the most secure places. And his uh, feet were fastened with stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. The reason I chose this is because of the word loosed. Because in the scriptures, the word ransom, lutron in the Greek, means to loosen or to release. And so here we have this idea of the loosening of the chains. And with Alice Johnson, she was loosened or released from a life sentence to come back into society. So those two examples, the one of Paul and the one of Mrs. Johnson, they mirror the truth about all of us. And that is that we are captive and bound 
and in debt to our sin before a holy God, right? Romans 3.23 tells us, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, you know, presidents, they can only pardon you out of a place. The judges can only release you from a penalty or a, a, a verdict. A bail bondsman, a bail can only release your body out of a prison. But only one person can release you from an eternal captivity and an eternal debt, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, right, in Acts 4.12, that there is only one name, right? No other name is given among men by which we must be saved. It is Jesus Christ. He and he alone can do this. And that's why I would like you to turn one more time with me to, to 1 Timothy 2, 6. 1 Timothy 2, 6, 2, 5 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And verse 6 says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The Lord gave himself as a ransom. His pains for our chains. He releases us. And you'll notice that it's the giving of himself. So it's not like maybe presidents or judges or the bail bondsmen where they use some instrument in their power to release. But the release here, the ransom is Jesus himself. So a ransom, obviously, it's paying some kind of a price in order to effect a release. This is why Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, I did not come to serve, but to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And so Christ is the one that pays this price, and he is, uh, Paul is instructing Timothy and reminding Timothy of this truth about Christ being the ransom for all. The problem is, is that uh, we in our human nature, we're always looking for ways either to pretend or to flatter ourselves that we have some part to play in this. But someone in prison might have the option of parole and through good behavior shave some time off and perhaps get released early. But that's a problem when it comes to the bigger scheme of God and us, the eternal scheme. Because Isaiah 64, 6 says... All of our righteousnesses are as a filthy rag. Whatever we do is not done in God before we're saved. It's done out of pride. It's done out of reasons that we think we're just doing good for someone else. And they're not toward God. So God doesn't accept an unbeliever's good works. There is no merit system to reach heaven in the eyes of God. And this is why the idea of ransom is used in Scripture as one of. It's like if you put salvation in the middle of an intersection and you have a four-way intersection, there's several angles at which you can approach what the Bible teaches about salvation. Justification, reconciliation, and now ransom. Ramp is just another angle at which, another aspect of the saving work of the Lord. And the Lord uses it in his word a number of times because he's trying to teach us that we were captive, that we were held, that we were bound by our own sin and our own guilt, and that we were under the wrath of God. And as the scripture tells in John 3, 36, those who do not believe remain under the wrath of God, and that we are subject to the penalty that is due because God is just and holy. So we're the ones that are trapped, we're the ones that are held, Yet we can't release ourselves because we lack what it takes. We ourselves are the guilty ones. How can the guilty release himself if he's still guilty? You know, if you take a man who's serving a 10-year sentence and after his first year of serving, he says, all right, I'm done, I'm ready to be out, release me. The judge is going to say, You're only, you've only served one of 10 years. You can't get out. You're still guilty. You're still paying. I'll tell you when we consider you innocent, when you finished your sentence. When you finished your sentence, the law will consider you innocent 
and you'll be set free. How can the guilty clear themselves while they're still guilty? They can't. This is the reason that Jesus said here in John, well, Paul wrote it, why God says in, in 1 Timothy 2.6, Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. It's him. And this is why the Bible, as I said, mirrors and gives examples of this. So you take someone like Lazarus. What did Lazarus do to get himself out of his death and his body being in the tomb? Nothing. It's Jesus who said, come forth, Lazarus. Christ gave him life. He was held and bound by death itself, and the Lord set him free. Who is it many times? Paul and Peter both in the book of Acts are in prison. And you will see that in the scriptures it always shows either an angel or an earthquake, something God uses to release those men out of those prisons and set them free. Even Satan himself, if you read Revelation chapter 20, verses 3 and 7, you will see that even Satan himself is only released, loosened up from the pit he was in by God. So if Paul and Peter, if Lazarus, if even Satan cannot affect their own release, what makes you think that we can affect our own release? We cannot. We cannot. This is why the Lord says, I am the ransom for you. This reminds me of John Wesley. John Wesley, a 18th century Anglican minister. He was a part of uh, what he and others designed called the Holy Club. He was very zealous. He was very religious. And as he studied the Bible and as he tried to conform his life and shape his life to be a model of good, religious, upstanding, moral person, and indeed many people admired him and George Whitfield, who was also a part of the Holy Club, and others, as some students made fun of them and mocked them, other students admired them. And John Wesley and his brother get together, and the decision is made that he's going to take a trip to the United States. And he's riding on this boat over the Atlantic with the Moravians, another uh, Christian group. And, of course, they go through stormy seas and all kinds of things. And he notices something about the Moravians that he lacked he saw that the Moravians had like a true, deep dependence and faith, unshakable even literally in the midst of a storm at the sea. And the way they prayed and the way they talked about the Lord, he noticed they had an actual personal relationship with God that he lacked. Yes, John Wesley went to Oxford for seminary trained and taught in religion and theology and very familiar with his Bible, yet he realized he was still in bondage to his sin. He was still captive to his sin. And he, so, he felt so convicted as he watched the lives of, of the Moravian believers. And on his way back to England, he, he became so troubled in his soul. And he was reading Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians, no, the book of Romans. And as he's reading through the beginning of the book, and Luther's talking about justification by faith, Luther, uh, Wesley says in his own words, I felt my heart strangely warmed. It had happened. He finally realized that his efforts, his religiosity, his knowledge, his dedication and energy, and his even his sense of calling meant nothing. He was still a captive. He was still held in his sins. And you know that very famous hymn that I, I love to sing, and maybe we'll sing it sometime, and can it be? He wrote that 
a number of years later in life. And verse 3, long fast my prison body lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night, but my eye, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. And so he talks about how the Lord shed the rays of light on him. And he says, my chains fell off. My heart was free. I woke and went forth and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? He describes that. As a very religious person, he says, I wasn't ransomed. I had not received the ransom of the Lord in my life. Jesus had, the, the, the price that Jesus had paid to set me free had not been applied to my life yet, he realizes. But it's so interesting how he writes about this being imprisoned in chains. The man had never been in jail before, but he does describe his imprisonment, and he's talking about sin's imprisonment and his guilt, and that he knew that only one person could release him. And even though he had a head knowledge of what Christ did on the cross, that was not sufficient, and it never is sufficient to just merely have an intellectual or a head knowledge of it. It has to be applied to our life. We have to surrender. We have to repent and turn from our own self you know, Paul talks about the Jews, his fellow Jews, uh, in, in, the, in an ethnic way, you know, as a, as a, as a group of people. And in, and in Romans chapter 10, verse 3, he said, they have, a zeal for, they have a zeal but not according to knowledge. And he says they are trying to work their own righteousness. And they are ignorant of the righteousness that comes only through the Lord. And you, you, can, you can see that, that uh, as, the, as the Israelites kept rejecting the Lord, that Paul is pained in his heart. He is at, at great pain to, to see that they are still searching for saving themselves or, in effect, ransoming themselves by their own good works, and it doesn't work. It never will work. And even Paul says this about himself, doesn't he? when he says that there was a righteousness that he was striving for. But he said in, 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 uh, in Philippians, he says, but the time came when I realized, he says, that I might gain Christ. I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Do you hear that possession? He's my Lord now. And I count all the, I mean, Paul had like the PhD in, in Old Testament and Hebrew. He was the Pharisees of Pharisees. He traveled all over Turkey, all over Asia Minor, tracking down Christians, getting them to admit that they're a follower of Christ, and then having them put in prison, or having them stoned to death as capital punishment. He spent his career doing that. And he was trying to follow the law and he was probably doing a fairly good job of it. He was highly esteemed. But he says, those things that at one time in my life were a gain to me, they were a reward for me. He says, I've counted them loss for Christ. He says, they're all rubbish, they're all trash. Literally, in the, in the Greek, it's they are manure. And that's what he says in Philippians 3.8. I indeed count all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So when the Lord ransoms, when Jesus ransoms a sinner, he is releasing them because he paid the ransom price. He redeems them. He buys them out of that bondage. And 
when he does that, he also gives his righteousness to them. And they can be declared right with God. And that righteousness never is achievable by our own works. You know, when we think of Paul, and I think back on those lyrics that I was just going over with you, how John Wesley said, the eye of the Lord diffused light on me. And he describes his heart as a dark dungeon. And then he talks about how his chains fell off and his heart was free. And he immediately rose up and went forth and followed thee. He followed God. And he describes that amazing love. And he asked the question, how can it be that he would die for me? You see, because he realized what a debt he was in. He realized that his sin, considered fairly and justly, only should result in his judgment. And that's what happens with us. To the extent we realize our sin is the extent to which we appreciate God. Because when we appreciate God, we will do just like Wesley did. I will rise immediately and I will go forth and I will follow him. My life is all for him. And it's the same thing that Paul did, isn't it? Paul's life completely changed. It changed so much that people were having a hard time believing it. In fact, of course, in, in Acts chapters 9 and 10, when, when Paul is converted and then he goes to Ananias and, and then they take him to one of the churches there in Acts and they said, hey, I want to bring Paul in, bring, bring Saul in. And they're like, what do you mean? You mean that Saul? And they say, yeah, he's been changed. They're like, we don't believe it. That guy has been persecuting the church, having us arrested, having us killed for years. And you're telling me you're bringing him here to us now? And so the Bible says there in Acts that Barnabas and others had to convince the church of the, of the truthfulness of Paul's conversion. And then he is brought in. But what a change it made in him. And that's why in Romans chapter 6, verse 18, Paul can say this, And having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. When you're set free from your sin, you become a slave of righteousness. Now, for some people, that might not be very appealing. We think, well, if, if God sets me free, I'm free, and I can just go out and do what I want. No, that is not at all what the Scripture teaches. The Scriptures teach us that every person has a master. The question is not who. Uh, the question is not will I or if I have one. The question is which one is it? Is my master going to be Satan or is my master going to be the Lord? You can't serve both. You have to serve one or the other. There's only two. And so the scriptures make clear to us here through Paul, who himself experienced that liberation. He's been ransomed. He's been purchased back by Christ through his death and resurrection. And he says, we have been, Christians have been set free from sin, and now we become slaves of righteousness. So one way that we can tell we've really been ransomed is if we are happy to be a slave of righteousness. A slave of righteousness. Can't you hear it in Wesley? When his chains fell off and his heart was free, he rose immediately and he followed thee. He followed God. And he spent the rest of his life doing that. No one who has truly been ransomed has trouble following righteousness. It doesn't mean we'll be perfect, but the tenor, the contours, the shape, the trajectory of our life will be toward righteousness. And I can now only imagine, indeed she's written a book, Alice Johnson, telling her whole story, very interesting. I can only imagine now Alice Johnson, she was very happy to go from one set of laws to another set of laws. You see, when she was in the federal penitentiary, she was under the laws and regulations of a federal penitentiary. But when she was released by pardon, in other words, when she was ransomed, out, loosened from the bonds of prison, 
she was very happy to fall under the laws of our society and our country. She was happy to do that. And so it is with a true Christian. When a Christian gets ransomed, he doesn't go, oh, now I've got to try to you know, serve the Lord and I've got to try to live for Him. And, oh boy, I, I was just kind of hoping to be free from myself. No. The Christian will say, I'm so glad to be underneath, from underneath that master that held me captive. And now I welcome my new master, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm happy to serve him, to be a slave of his, to follow his law, to follow his ways. So there's a big difference. It has to do with what motivates us and what is the direction of our life and what, where our affections are found. Are they in Christ who ransoms or not? And that is a good question for us. First of all, have you experienced the ransoming work of Christ? That is, by repentance and trust in Christ alone, He Himself is our ransom. He purchases us out by the price of His own life, His own blood, His own life on the cross. He purchases us out of darkness, out of bondage, out of condemnation, out of of slavery to sin and into his marvelous light and into the kingdom of his beloved son and into a new slavery that we embrace belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ as our master. Can that, does that describe you? If not, please talk to me after the service. Please talk to me this week. Send me an email. Come by and visit me. I would be happy to talk with you more since you would be interested. And if this describes you, then praise God as we now transition right into the Lord's Supper. Because the Lord's Supper is nothing more than a visible reminder of the ransom work of Christ. The giving of his body, the shedding of his blood. He was the ransom. And so when Christians partake in the Lord's Supper, they're saying, here is the ransom represented in the juice and in the bread or the, or the crackers. Here is the ransom that was required. And it's the only ransom possible. And I celebrate by being reminded, this Christ has set me free from my sin, from both the power and the penalty of sin. And this ransom has put me into a new ownership by Christ. And I want to serve him all the days of my life. Let's pray. And after we pray, we'll begin the Lord's Supper. Oh, Father God, when we think of someone like Mrs. Johnson and how excited she was to be liberated from that prison and so ready to follow the laws of our country as a free person. And Lord, it's the same for us. Christians are so happy to be free from sin and now free to follow your law in our life. And it doesn't take the twisting of an arm to get us to want your ways. We want them already because we realize what we've been liberated from we realize that you purchased us because you are the ransom, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for it. And Father, we pray that anyone here who's misled by the idea that they can earn it, that they can achieve it, or that being religious is all it takes, oh Father, I pray that they would now see this is not true and that they're living under a terrible delusion. Lord, no one is ever good enough. There is none righteous, no, not one. Only you ransom us. Our faith and our trust in what you've done is all we need to be made right with you. Father, give us a profound gratefulness and give us a deep reminder that should make us so comforted 
and should cause us even to renew our sense of wanting to live for you with gratitude. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to uh, set the stage here, so to speak, in the scriptures from 1 Corinthians 11. And uh, Paul, of all people, is telling the Corinthian church about how he himself received instructions from the Lord, and now he's giving them to this church. And as I've already said to you, the the body and the blood of Christ are symbolized here, and they're memorialized. They're a reminder to us of what the Lord has done for us. And so let's take a moment to think about that ransom price of Jesus himself. His disciples had a hard time believing. You mean you, mean you are the one that's going to go to the cross? You mean you're going to die? Can't, isn't there some other way? Don't you have the power to just make things different? And the Lord says, you'll understand more and more, I have to go to the cross. I am the ransom. I am the price paid. Oh, Father God, we are so grateful, aren't we? So grateful. And so we see here these passages in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. And so we start with the the wafer, the cracker. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. So let's take just a moment. We'll do a, we'll do a, we'll do a prayer like uh, we see in Scripture. They're short. Let's bow our heads. Father, the bread, a picture of the body of Christ. Christ incarnate, he became a man for us to be a fit substitute to go in our place to the cross. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of your body. In Jesus' name, amen. And he took that bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Praise God. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. A new covenant. A covenant is a promise. So it's a new promise. It's a new arrangement that God had made. And Christ himself says, I am the new covenant. He says that in Matthew and in Luke. I am the new covenant. And it's in my blood. So let's take a moment to thank him for that. Join me in prayer. Father, oh, how we thank you for the shedding of your blood. Uh, The scripture tells us that the life is in the blood. This is why we don't want anyone to bleed for too long because their life will leave them. But Lord, you voluntarily bled on the cross and died. And blood being that picture, that symbol a blood that is not tainted with sin, but is righteous and pure, that cleanses us from our sins. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for that. And we just want to acknowledge and rejoice and praise you tonight for the shedding of your blood on our behalf. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. And so we took that cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Paul goes on to say, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Please stand to your feet and let's close out with a final song and praise God for his ransom work on our behalf. Amen.
give you a word of benediction. Jude 24 and 5. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And this is the time of the year for joy, isn't it? Joy to the Lord, for he has come. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you all. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill.